Thank you for coming today. It's so good to see everyone on the call. Before we get going with the main presentation, I do want to acknowledge that Alberta is the homeland of many Indigenous peoples. It is the ancestral land of many First Nations peoples and within the boundaries of colonial Alberta, we live on the land of the First Nations Treaty 6, Treaty 7 and Treaty 8 territories, as well as a small portion of the treaty, territory of Treaty 10 in the Northeast and Treaty 4 in the Southeast. We also recognize this is the home of eight Métis settlements and the Métis nations of Alberta. My name is Alicia Fox. I am part of the community development and engagement team here at RPAP. Our team can be found across the province working with rural communities in the realm of attraction and retention of healthcare providers. I am fortunate enough to live in the small community of Innisfail. Um, so in the work that we do with our communities, we have found that there is um, an interest in learning more about other health-related organizations that are connected to rural Alberta. And by hosting these information sessions, we hope that rural Albertans will come away feeling informed about what's happening and available in their communities. Today, we are so thrilled to have Susan Smith, Vanessa Weatherby, and Alicia Kerber with AHS Medical Affairs with us to give a little bit more insight on the process of physician recruitment and the work that they do in rural Alberta. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our speakers. Perfect. Thanks so much, Alicia. I'll close this off. I don't know if that's my on me or not, but just in case. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, I am Vanessa Weatherby. I'm a senior consultant with Medical Affairs. Uh, I am joined today by Susan Smith, a physician resource planner in the North Zone, and Alicia Kerber, a physician resource, re resource planner in the South Zone. Okay. So they are the experts, so they're probably the ones that you're familiar with. Um, uh, so during the presentation, if there's anything that you need clarification or you have any questions, please put it into the chat box um, and we will clarify it as we as we go. So an hour goes by really quickly. So today we're going to kind of skip over the intricate nuances and the details and speak to how most physicians are recruited and compensated. Depending on the specialty, there may be lots of other arrangements and if the physician also has a university appointment. So today we'll really just focus on the simple fee for service. Um, before we even get to recruitment though, it's really important to set up the understanding of how healthcare is structured in Alberta, the difference between Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services, the boundaries AHS has in communities and community practices. It is also really important to highlight the other organizations that are involved in physician that we won't even get a chance to touch on. Um, so that's the College of Physicians and Surgeons of, of Alberta, which we, you know, called the CPSA, the U of A and U of C medical schools, the Alberta Medical Association, and even our host RPAP, um, as well as the challenges of recruiting physicians that are not Canadian or permanent residents or Canadian trained and need to be assessed. Basically to, to really give a very broad overview, universal healthcare for Canadians is a federal legislation, yet provincial government has a primary responsibility for financing, organizing, and delivering healthcare services. The province directly funds physicians and contracts with health authorities to deliver hospital and long-term care, med, uh, mental health services, and other public health services. Alberta Health Services is the contracted health authority in Alberta. The provincial government is Alberta Health, so that is, you know, the big wheel the start of it all. The premier appoints an elected official to be the Minister of Health. I, with the pandemic, I think we've all become very familiar with who the Minister of Health is and kind of more their roles and responsibilities. The community physician is an independent contractor who bills Alberta Health for the services they provide. And they may either provide those services in their own office or in an AHS facility and, hosp or, and or hospital. So let's break down the scope of responsibilities for these for everyone. So what is everyone's role and responsibility in healthcare? So Alberta Health is they set the healthcare policy, the legislation, and the standards for the for the health system in Alberta. Alberta Health Services, which is us, is the delivery and health provider in Alberta, and we receive funding from Alberta Health. And then the community physician is a private business. The physician bills Alberta Health for any services that they provide. So I was asked by my friend one day kind of to explain my job and how, you know, the, the weird 
set up of physicians and, you know, that they're private contractors. And he had no understanding of all of this. So I was trying to think of like a good analogy and he is a very sports minded individual. So the best thing that I could come up with was comparing it to like sports leagues. And so it's a little bit nuanced. It's not a great comparison, but it's, it's not bad. So uh, basically because of, you know, the um, battle of Alberta going on right now and the playoffs, I thought we'll use the NHL as our, as our sports league of choice today. So basically the NHL, they set the rules of the game, the game length, the, you know, the salary caps that teams must work within the league policies, the league standards. So that's kind of what Alberta health does. They set the standards, the health legislation, they set the budget, uh, they determine the fee for service compensation. They're kind of like the overall um, setter of the healthcare game, should, should you say. So within the, you know, within the NHL league, we, there's these NHL teams. So they set their own team policy, their team standards. They hire employees for their team. So that could be, you know, coaches, nutritionists, trainers, whatever it may be. Um, they determine schedules of who plays and when. Uh, and they also contract uh, players. So they like send out, you know, try to recruit players to their team, offering them, you know, X amount under their um, salary cap and try, try to make the best team that they can with the uh, money allowance they're given. And so we're kind of like, you know, an NHL team. So we deliver and provide the healthcare within a set budget. We hire our own staff. So that's the nurses, the admin, janitorial service, you know, everyone else besides basically physicians comes out of a budget that we are given. Uh, we set policies for staff and the services that we provide. And then on top of that, we contact, we contract physicians as they are an independent uh, contractor. They don't, they are not employees of Alberta Health Services. Um, so just, this is where it gets a little nuanced, but I only looked it up for the purpose of uh, this presentation just out of interest. So technically, um, hockey players don't become independent contractors. They actually are determined to be NHL employees, not the team, uh, but independent uh, physicians are independent contractors. Uh, so that's kind of where this falls apart a little bit at the end here. But at the end of the day, they both kind of represent the team or the organization that they are contracted with. So just to be clear, fee-for-service is also called the schedule of medical benefits. So in Alberta, if, if physician X uh, provides X services, they get X dollars. Um, and that's when we talk about fee-for-service, that's the compensation. So if, you know, if they consult, if they do this surgery, it is in a big book that says you get X amount of dollars for that procedure. And uh, that's how they're paid. So let's go back to what AHS is and what our purpose is to do. So we are the largest health authority in Canada and we get our budget from um, Alberta Health and that is the provincial government. And the provincial government also provides us a list of priorities uh, depending on you know, platforms that they run on, things that you know, are important that they wanna see, changes to healthcare system within their tenure of government. So just as an example, that could be something like reduced surgical wait times. So we do get li like a list of priorities that we must kind of try to tackle while also providing healthcare for all Albertans and have quality care when they need it within the budget that we are given. So I'll go back to that third wheel to talk about community physicians and where our role is and where it's not. Um, so community physicians and their community practice are private business. If a physician has an independent license from the CPSA, aka they are qualified to work and have a billing number from Alberta Health to charge fee for service, they can set up a practice. So all they have to do is go on to Alberta Health and apply for a license um, to, to get her a billing number to bill fee for service and they can go set up a sign and go bill. AHS has zero involvement in any of this. So AHS wouldn't even be aware that this position exists. So it's also important to note that their fee-for-service earnings um, need to pay their staff, their rent, their utilities, aka all their overhead of operating and owning a business. So that is inside of their private office. Everything, all their fee-for-service earnings needs to cover 
those aspects as well as salaries and whatnot. So that same doctor in a small community, may, you may also see them at a hospital or a facility. So how do they get there? The physician in that hospital will still be billing fee for service, um, but AHS is involved in their recruitment, their scope of practice, the scheduling. Um, we ensure that they are you know, qualified, that they're doing the right things at the right place at the right time. Um, so how do we get someone to come and work in a hospital? So for that, let's break it down to what AHS is and the medical affairs structure before we get to the recruitment piece. Uh, so medical affairs in all of AHS is divided into five zones and there are some provincial programs. So for example, that could be APL, which is Alberta Precision Laboratories, uh, Cancer Care, um, and those are the only ones, public health, there's a, there's a few, but I, those are the ones off the top of my head right now. Uh, each zone has a medical affairs office and a zone medical director. So it's best to become familiar with your medical affairs office and those inside of that office. Should you have questions or concerns regarding anything happening within your zone, that's probably the first start. Uh, and recruitment is handled by each zone and uh, provincially for the provincial programs as well. And basically just the nuts and bolts of it is medical affairs is everything physician. So everything from their recruitment to the discipline to uh, privileging to, you know, assessing and all these things, we just do everything for, for physicians. So to talk about um, what guides our work and the, you know, the, the guidelines that we must work in as, uh, as employees of AHS and how, and physicians, um, there's a, there's a lot of factors, but I will just outline the, the big ones here. So as mentioned, physicians are not employees, therefore they are governed by the medical staff bylaws and rules. It lays out the ages expectations of them and what they can expect as a member of the medical staff at AHS. This includes everything from requirements of recruitment to how physicians are to be disciplined and sanctioned. These are provincial medical staff rules, which are more detailed. Oh, sorry. Let me just step back here for one second regarding the, the bylaws. So these are voted upon uh, with many legal AMA um, and, and AHS, uh, and they are kind of the holy grail of what we go by. Because physicians are not employees, they do not, uh, we cannot, you know, discipline them or use the same employee law that we would for any others at AHS. So that's kind of what the purpose of the bylaws are. Um, we also have provincial medical staff rules, which are a bit more detailed than the bylaws and zones also have their own set of medical staff rules. So although physicians are not employees, they are still bound to AHS policies, procedures and codes of conduct, travel policies and recruitment policies. These policies and procedures are the rules that we as in medical affairs also must work within when recruiting physicians. These policies are strict in ensuring everything is done with fiscal accountability and responsibility. So the, and the third one here is the CMO policies and CMO standing for chief medical officer are policies which are specific to physicians ensuring there's a clear understanding and guideline for everything within medical affairs. So while there are a lot of boundaries to work within, it is because of how high the stakes are with physicians. So if a mistake from a physician is the difference between life and death, we need to ensure that we have the right person doing the right job at the right place. So how do we even begin to identify the need to recruit somebody? So it all starts with the physician resource planners uh, and all the work that they do, including physician workforce forecasting. So sometimes it can be as simple as, you know, physician A leaves, therefore we need to recruit physician B. Sometimes the community is aging and there's an increase in demand for services. Sometimes there's a new facility or hospital opening that needs to be filled. Sometimes it's all of these things all at once. Um, again, these are very simplified examples. Uh, there is a lot that goes into consideration into identifying needs uh, for vacancies. And there is also, um, you know, allied health professionals that make that add another layer of complexity. So what can a nurse practitioner do? What can, you know, uh, 
a respiratory therapist do and you know do we need another physician here or can we have an an, an allied health professional kind of close that gap between that need so once we've identified a need what's next we need to complete an impact analysis to determine if there's organizational capacity. Similar to the village it takes to raise a child, it takes an organization for a physician to practice. Even though a physician bills fee for service, the question is not whether we have the budget to hire this one individual. It becomes a, a multitude of questions. Does lab have capacity for a physician ordering more, more lab tests? Does dictation have capacity for another physician's transcription for charting? Is there a OR time for another physician. So if these departments are already short staffed and overwhelmed and don't have budget to hire more, what does this recruitment mean for them? So these again are just a small example of how a raindrop that is a single physician um, recruitment can cause ripples that impact several departments and many, many people. So there's much more that goes into you know, needing to hire a physician than just that one individual and that one budget. So if that when that impact analysis is approved, what do we do now that we have, you know, medical leaders have signed off on it, several departments have signed off saying that, you know, they have capacity. So now we post a position. So all of our positions are posted on Dr. Jobs Alberta. This is for transparency. Every single job goes up there, not one is missed. So the candidate selection process, depending on the zone or department can vary, but only as as much as who is doing that. So in larger zones, for example, um, in Calgary and Edmonton, uh, these steps may happen at, at the department level, you know, further away from medical affairs. Um, and in bigger cities, this at the site visit um, stage, the understanding of fit for a community and may not be as important. So depending on the where, it can really differ of what we are looking for in a candidate. But these are the milestones that every medical affairs group must hit. So we have full transparency in the interview. We always do a search and selection committee. We try to eliminate as much bias and have a full range of uh, those on an interview panel. So especially in rural recruitment, what we deem successful is not just filling a vacancy, but having a physician come, live and work and stay in that community. When they become an integrated member of the community, there's only so much HS can do from an organizational standpoint to achieve this. This is why organizations such as RPAP and the work attention and her attraction and retention committees do to welcome physicians and integrate them into the community are so vital to the success of the physician in that community's health care. We do strive to find the right person for the right place while working within our organizational boundaries and authority. So the other big thing to remember here um, is that AHS is a taxpayer funded organization. So everything that we do, we try to ensure that we are fiscally responsible. Uh, we ensure that we are being appropriate with money and that that is at the forefront of our mind uh, for most things that are, we undertake as well, because you know, we understand that this is just, we're not, we're not playing with monopoly money. This is Albertans hard earned money that we need to make sure that we're um, spending accordingly. The other big thing that is important to remember with physicians is that we do not control the supply of them. Uh, and there's also no quick way to get more. So it's, it's, there's no weekend course where you can become a doctor overnight. There's no quick way to, you know, up someone's training so they can suddenly become a medical doctor and the most responsible person that these things take a long time. So when we know that we have a short supply, and it's national or it's even international, it's not a problem that gets solved in a month. It takes you know, years before that issue can be addressed due to the length of time it, be, it takes to become a physician or a specialist or you know, an enhanced, enhanced skills type of thing. It's, it's not a quick fix. Um, and the other thing that's really important to note, which is again, where 
you know, these uh, attraction and retention committees are so vital is that money doesn't make them stay. You know, I think it's been shown over and over across many provinces, many countries that as much as you can give a physician as incentives, um, bonuses, et cetera, that's not what gets them to stay. It is that community tie, it's that family involvement, it's that, that they see that this is a, a place where they want to raise their family, be involved, you know, take their kids to soccer practice. Um, those are the vital things that really make a physician want to be part of a community. Um, and we understand the, the vital importance of those things as well. So that's, that's kind of also a very important part to uh, physician recruitment. So um, I know I talk very quickly, so I blew through my presentation. <laughs> so I apologize because I get very nervous when I speak. Um, so I, I'm gonna uh, see if there's any questions or comments, uh, but here is our email for drjobs.ab um, at ahs.ca. And so that is a great place to any job related questions or recruitment questions. Um, that is monitored very closely. So you'll get a quick uh, reply from that one. But uh, I guess I'll open it up and then it, I, because I did go so fast, I can go over a couple of things more details should, uh, should you have some more questions because I did try to just do a very big overview because an hour does go very quick. Good morning. Uh, could you, could you uh, discuss the um, recruiting doctors through immigration, some of the processes that have to go through there? Sure. So that one is, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give some history as well. In 2014, that process became uh, much harder as the federal government at that time realized that there was some use and abuse going on. So the stipulations that you had to meet to be able to uh, get approved for an LMIA, which is a labor market impact assessment, uh, the standard became much higher. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky as an organization because um, as I've mentioned, we're not empl the employer of physicians, but we are doing an LMIA, you know, as an understanding that we're trying to bring um, healthcare providers under the uh, healthcare structure that we work in. So it, it doesn't work great, but what, so what we have to do, there's, uh, we have to advertise in, you know, multiple places. We have to show what we've done to try to recruit Canadians and permanent residents to that. We have to show, um, you know, initiatives that we're doing to rely less on, uh, foreign trained physicians. So, you know, are we opening up more seats? Are we doing training? Are we, you know, all of these things, but it, but again, it's tricky because you can't offer a weekend course to get a Canadian trained doctor by Monday. So, you know, even anything that we try to um, initiate, it's it can be a 10 year process before we would see the benefit of something like that as well. So with all of those things that becomes part of an, the LMIA application with the posting and having, you know, the right someone apply to it um, and then that gets submitted to Service Canada. So they go through our application and say, yeah, you can bring a um, foreign trained physician into the country to come work. And uh, even that process can take up to two years. So from, you know, from posting her from, sorry, from the approval of the LMIA before that physician is seeing the whites of eyes of patients can be a, even a two year process. Sorry, and Vanessa, can I elaborate on that a little bit absolutely. as well? That, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that labor market impact assessment, um, is really specific to a, an internationally trained doctor who does not hold permanent residency in Canada. So we do have international medical grads that have pursued in the interim um, permanent residency status. And the process for the same for both, whether they have residency status or, um, or not, um, is usually any international medical doctor who has done all their training outside of Canada can qualify for a provisional register license with the CPSA. 
What that means is that they require um, an assessment sponsored by AHS. And in Alberta, AHS is the only um, health authority that can sponsor physicians for, for that practice. So there's a lot of moving parts in that. A full assessment um, does it is about six months. So there's a first portion is a three months and that's 100% supervised with an assessor where the physician um, is essentially working with um, a physician in Alberta that's in practice and has a general register license and, um, and they're being integrated into the Canadian healthcare system. So it's an opportunity for them to understand the fee for service billing, how our healthcare system works um, and, and be assessed for their skills that they're going to be bringing into, into the job as well. And then the second portion is um, a supervised practice assessment. It's where the physician will work as the most responsible practitioner. So that's when we see them um, start in the community um, or the health facility that they're contracted to. And um, for timeline wise as well, from the time of interview to the time of commencing practice in the community um, on that assessment route is anywhere from eight to 12 months. So those processes do take quite a bit of time. The college becomes the primary point of contact through a lot of that. Um, and that information is also available on the CPSA's website um, through registration assessments, um, just kind of what some of that looks like. Yeah. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, with that as well, I wanted to also highlight, um, I, like Alicia kind of touched on it, but we need the importance of those assessments and also just because they're a medical doctor in one country does not mean that they're able to be a medical doctor in this country. So, and that are standards that are set by um, the Royal College, by the CPSA that we have no control over. And they already, they have a list of approved and not approved. Uh, so if they are on the not approved list, there's nothing that we can do to kind of do anything like that. They're gonna have to start over from scratch, basically. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of, moving pieces that we need to keep in mind, especially with internationally trained physicians. Um, and because we need to ensure that level of quality care and that they are able to do everything that they say they do, that's why we have to get them assessed. They need to be, you know, they have to meet the Canadian standard of what we ex expect as Canadians from a healthcare provider. So those things are very important. So just because they've applied and say that they're a doctor, doesn't mean that they're a doctor in this country, unfortunately. Hi, um, I, I'm on the uh, Prairie Mountain Health Advisory Council, um, and I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about the um, uh, candidate selection committee or whatever you call it. And specifically, um, do you have, um, like in Banff, for example, I know that the hospital here has their own little committee that they're trying to within the I think it's within the community so how does that relate to your your um, selection group and is there sort of a cross um, like are the rep community representatives on that on your committee or how does that work so our committees will vary depending on department and position uh, and you know as well as zone obviously so um for AHS positions there would unlikely to be anyone that is a community representative at that stage. Um, we are trying to determine more of a medical fit at that point rather than um, a community fit just to ensure that they are a, you know, a qualified uh, physician for that position. Uh, the search and selection committee, we do have um, a recommended standard that, you know, it consists of men and women. It consists of, you know, different, um, diversities as well to try to get a large, as large as selection as that we can to eliminate any bias uh, and, you know, nepotism, all those other, you know, uh, fun HR words that we try to avoid. Um, you know, we, the standard is a minimum of three people uh, that could vary depending on availability and, uh, and whatnot. So uh, unfortunately, because I'm going to have to refer you know, uh, defer to Alicia or Susan on this one because they are more involved in who would be on those for their zones uh, rather than my generalized statements <laughs> of uh, what uh, our, our guidelines are for as an overall group. I think that's great. There's, um, you know, so in our, in our rurals and in Banff, you know, is considered into the into one of our urban zones, but is a more kind of rural community. So same type of thing where 
um, you know, a lot of the times our health centers um, or the community clinics, I should say, are attached to the health centers and AHS is recruiting to the health center. And in tandem with that, a physician um, and the hope is that they will have a community practice as well. And that community practice, again, can sometimes be associated or attached to that health center. And so we do try to collaborate, um, you know, with recruitment and keep, um, you know, th that type of stuff in mind. We have community medical directors at our facilities. And a lot of times those community medical directors, they have that AHS contracted medical leader hat on, and they do also work in the clinic. They are a physician in the clinic. They're providing services to the community and it's important for them to recruit to their community clinic um, as well. So they will, um, they will keep their um, clinic members in, in the loop. They will communicate with their physicians, um, um, try to keep them involved in not just the physicians, but the other staff as well. So the administrative staff, the clinic managers, um, we do have kind of, um, you know, I shouldn't say all the time, but most of the time, especially if it's an open recruitment case, communication with the clinic managers too. Um, but usually as a, as a standard, it's um, a physician resource planner, a medical leader, and another physician member in our AHS interviews. Um, if a medical leader chooses, sometimes they do have their clinic manager attend, um, attend the, the interviews. And then any interviews, um, sometimes there's a separate interview process um, for the community piece. And then I think really where the benefit to, um, to those crossovers, so especially those attraction and retention committees that are that that are available in different communities that become very vital to us in our process is when we have a physician come for a site visit. Um, so kind of once we've had interviews and reference checks and we're pretty sure this physician is going to be a great fit. We want to bring them to com the community, get them integrated, um, meeting different community members. And at that point is when it's very important for us that we expose them to the community um, during a site visit, um, as much exposure, any exposure that we can provide. And that's community tours, um, obviously hospital tours or health center tours, and, um, and trying to meet with various um, community members, committee members that exist if that does exist. Um, and then that's a very vital piece going forward as well as the physicians integrating into the community starting practice. Okay, thank you very much. Susan, had you wanted to add to that? You're on mute right now. I do um, actually, there's, uh, oh. I, I, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Wrong this, Susan, this is, sorry, go ahead, Susan Giesbrecht. Yeah, I, there's, there's one other question I, I just to uh, make everything a little clearer to me. Um, RPAP just works with physician recruitment. My question is, as we are having such a difficult time recruiting physicians, especially to the Wabasca area um, and a couple of other healthcare centers we have in our area, have you guys considered nurse practitioner recruitment? As you know, they, they can do almost 90% of what doctors do, uh, physicians do, uh, as a way of filling that gap. Thank you. And sorry, so just, um, just for um, clarification, RPAP um, is um, helpful, like extremely vital to us in attraction and retention. AHS has that recruitment focus. Um, and, and definitely Vanessa or Susan yeah. jump in here on this, but yeah. nurse practitioners um, have absolutely been considered. There's, you know, um, varying conversations, even around physician assistance, which has recently now been recognized with CPSA, um, you know, where they're, where they're going to be licensed for the CPSA is all um, in consideration and had multiple conversations about care models um, that are available. And there's kind of two um, areas because that's operational funding as well for nurse practitioners, which is another, you know, kind of piece that it falls out of medical affairs actually for nurse practitioners and I'll let Vanessa you might be able to speak a bit yeah, better to that that's no but that's great uh so there's there's many different uh disciplines that can help um balance out the need for physicians uh so you know that's anything from family medicine with enhanced you know enhanced skills for obstetrics anesthesia surgical skills um nurse practitioners uh Oh my gosh! Why can't I think of them? The the baby ones. What are, <laughs> um, what are they called? Why can't why is that? healthcare aids? No. Oh, uh, sorry. 
midwives um, midwives there you go <laughs> oh my gosh um so yes there is there is a long list of allied health professionals that we can uh we do in every capacity um try to consider um in assisting with uh helping take off the burden of the healthcare load on physicians one of the issues are that you know these these other you know we've always relied very heavily on physicians in Canada and in Alberta as the most responsible, you know, person for healthcare. So it's one, it's a mindset of, you know, us trying to reimagine the model Two, it's a public perception of reimagining the model um, that, you know, they, they come in, they, they see a nurse practitioner they're wondering where their physician is, where their doctor is. So there's there's also a change within the public perceptions that need to come along with, you know, what we're able to provide as well. And then just ensuring that the resources around uh, those other given professions are there um, so that they have capacity and are able to fully practice within their scope. Um, so as I've said previously, we've always been physician kind of centric in how we've provided care. So in order to replace that physician with, um, you know, another profession, we have to ensure that the uh, surrounding, uh, you know, um, access that they would need is there. And uh, we also don't want to, I, like there's, it's a very delicate way to say that we're, we're not trying to replace physicians. Our issue, we still want physicians. We still want lots of people, to, physicians to come and work and live in Alberta. One of the issues that we're trying to work within is that we don't have enough and we don't have enough in, in certain spots. So how do we get physicians to these areas? Um, you know, we're not trying to take over, you know, limit what they're able to do, you know, limit what they're able to bill. That's not our intention at all. It's because we do struggle to get physicians to certain places. So we have to look at um, other models that we can do to provide help, you know, quality health care to all Albertans. And in order to do that, it is a very big juggling act with so many departments, so many um, ensuring that, you know, qualification support and everything that from an organizational capacity is there to ensure that that quality of care is there for everybody. Susan Smith, did you have something to add there? I, I did just a little bit back. I'm just kind of trying to on my other screen monitor the questions. And there was a little, there was a question that was kind of, and, and you've spoken to it, but it's um, in the North Zone. We, um, I, I think maybe have a bit to add. So the question was, do physicians have, um, um, what is it now here? Do they have input into hiring into their clinic? So, when we go back, uh, we, we approve a job, it's posted, we shortlist the in medical affairs or myself, look at all the applicants and make sure that the physicians that have applied either have a license to practice in Alberta or have went through the College of Physicians and Surgeons and are eligible to practice. And while we're doing that, or even when the job is posted, we send out an expression of interest to all of the physicians in that community to submit their interest in per participating on the search and recommendation, what we used to term interview panel. And Vanessa mentioned, we make sure that we have a responsibility that it's gender balanced, um, keeping in mind career stage experience and all of that. And that's whether it's a community or a larger hospital where it's a department. Those, that group of people then participate on the interview panel and in the North Zone, it might be structured a bit different than other zones and probably our biggest challenge is the geography. So we, um, where was I going with that? Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, so we invite those. All oh, right, okay, now I know. So <laughs> in order to have a vacancy, um, you know, there, there's the physician or the position is going to provide some hospital support. They're either going to work in the emergency department, you know, maybe long-term care, acute care, some sort of special programs. And our job after the interviews is taking the physician and family to the site, to the community for a site visit to meet with the attraction retention community, medical leaders, and 
make sure that they are aware of all the opportunities to practice, not just clinic A, because that physician happened to sit on the uh, interview panel. Maybe physician B was out of the country and couldn't participate. And physician C, you know, at his career stage, didn't want to. But the physicians that we recruit to the community, they're always made aware that they can um, join an existing clinic or they can start up their own clinic. Um, I just wanted, that might be a little bit different in the North Zone. I think the the question came from another zone. And there was... um, I think, I think that was it. Sorry, I just wanted to add that part in. Go ahead, Les, I, I think, yeah. I, I was just gonna say, Susan, that's great context, just to really um, you know, highlight that we we really do not get involved in uh, community clinics and you know who they recruit, how they recruit, any of that. That's not within our scope of boundaries, our authority, any of that. So we are really just focused on you know that small piece of recruitment for when it comes into a hospital or HS facility, that's really our responsibility. And anything outside of that is beyond our boundaries. And uh, we are respectful of, you know, communities and that they are a private business. And it is not in, you know, it is not our job to monitor and get ourselves mixed up in their business. Yeah, but we do we do invite their involvement and Absol- participation. Oh, absolutely! And yeah, the work that they do and, <laughs> yeah. You know, all of that. We we welcome yeah. all well, of we that don't, support. Yeah. So, yeah, we like we as much as they want to be involved and include themselves in AHS, we, they're welcome to become members of the medical staff, get all the um, information from AHS and, and that type of thing. But we're not going to go into a community clinic and tell them how to run their business. It's more the, uh, the side that I was getting to that um, that is not in our purview. But if they want to become members of AHS medical staff and get you know newsletters, information, all that type of thing, we welcome that. The more, the better. Thanks, Vanessa. Vanessa, I know that there were a couple of um, hands up here, but there were some questions that were sent in the chat. Is there any couple of questions that maybe you want to answer out of the chat? And then we'll kind of go back and forth between the people who have their hand up. So um, we still have time to get to you. I I don't have my chat open. So if anyone wants to read a question, I'm happy to answer it. Holly, did you want to maybe um, read one of the questions out there? Hi, I think... I think um... Susan did have one and she answered that one already. The other one was around um, discipline of physicians um, being governed by the college because um, it was a little bit unclear as to what um, around that works. <clears throat> no problem. That's a great question. Uh, so it, it's a very complicated, uh, w- um, not complicated, that, Truthfully, it's just hard to describe. Uh, So one of the things that we keep very well at the front of our mind is that uh, if someone can no longer be a doctor, uh, that is their livelihood that they have, you know, worked for 15 years to achieve. So it is a very big deal should they need to be disciplined or sanctioned. And we take that very seriously. So all uh, the way that it works in AHS, because they are not employees, it doesn't happen through um, human resources. It comes through medical affairs. And we have um, concerns consultants in every zone and provincially that uh, this is their entire job. So what it starts out with is a concern that comes through. And, you know, we have a medical leader investigate and find, you know, see if the concern is valid. And through the bylaws, it lays out exactly the process of, you know, you know, if it gets to, uh, if the concern is valid, what's the next stage, if this is, you know, depending on the level of, um, you know, of, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, egregiousness as um, determines the next steps and all those things. And if it's something that happens in a community, it is uh, dealt with at the CPSA level because it is outside of an AHS facility. Um, so we only deal with the physicians inside uh, incidents that happen inside an AHS facility. Um, so anything, you know, if you have a, a complaint about your doctor that you saw in your office, we would send that to um, the CPSA to deal with in their own way. Uh, so depending on the outcome, you know, most of the time it's just consensual resolution. So that is kind of a, a mediation. Uh, um, and we, you know, depending on talk to CPSA, uh, if they need, need, you know, 
if they need to stop practicing while we investigate, if, you know, they can still practice because it's, you know, could be any type of other issue. Uh, but the bylaws do outline very clearly the order of operations of how we are going to investigate and discipline a physician should they need to take, you know, courses, therapy, whatever it may be. And that's all done um, with very seriously with medical leaders um, overseeing everything. So, uh, you know, we ensure that we have physicians practicing with, um, you know, the, the right mindset and that uh, we ensure that every patient that physician sees is getting the best quality care. And I'll elaborate just a little bit more on that too, Vanessa, is um, kind of this, so the difference between the CPSA and AHS with that is that the CPSA is disciplining in consideration of a physician's license and ability to just practice overall. AHS, um, we're looking more at the discipline mandates that are related to the physician's medical staff appointment and privileging. Thank so that's yeah. um, also going to include like probationary assessments. So every physician starts out with a probationary appointment for a minimum of one year. And um, we go into probationary assessments, we have periodic reviews. So it's really when reference to, um, you know, any kind of disciplinary measures or things like that in AHS um, that have like the bylaws and rules as Vanessa spoke to is really our HR guidelines of how we would deal with disruptive behavior um, and anything related to things going on in that AHS facility. And I, I also want to point out that these, uh, when we use the bylaws and go through these part six as what we refer to them as, because it's part six of the bylaws, um, it is a very small percentage of physicians. It's, you know, less than 1% of physicians that uh, have these kinds of concerns. So it, you know, it's not something that's often, it's not something you need to worry about that, you know, that your physician <laughs> is having all these disciplinary issues. It's such a small percentage. Uh, so no need to be, <laughs> be concerned. Um, as well, but yes, it's it's what we would discipline is their uh, their medical staff appointment and say that you know you're no you're no longer welcome in an HS facility. But and you know we may or may not also refer them to the CPSA depending on the um, egregiousness of whatever the the concern was. Hey, Susan Smith has her hand up. Um, is that to answer a little bit to this question um, before we move to the next uh, couple of questions here with their hand up? Sorry, Susan, you're on mute. Well, I've gotten some, my mouse is not working. And the W is sticking <laughs> on my keyboard today. So I'm getting W's just a day, everywhere. Just a day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I live in the country. Um, sorry, I was trying to scroll through the gallery to see who is all present here. And I think I clicked on the, the raise the your hand. hand. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Um, so we have uh, Les Pearson has his hand up. And then Donna, I see your hand up as well. And then we'll jump back to any questions that might be in the chat. So Les, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, just a, two quick comments. I'm amazed that uh, doctors, in some cases, and especially sexual assault, uh, don't lose their license and uh, they get these special treatments and probations. But more importantly, uh, I'd like to have uh, some kind of uh, clarity between uh, of the relationship between uh, Alberta Health Services and the College of Physicians in terms of uh, setting quotas and uh, that's always a big question in rural Alberta. Why don't we just train more doctors in Alberta? And I know it's a political and an economic kind of a question, but I'm just curious about the relationship between Alberta Health Services and the, and the college in terms of setting those quotas. Is there any kind of discussion between those two agencies? Uh, so that is a very tricky question to answer and I will do my best. Uh, so the college has not set any quotas at this point in time. We are one of the only, it is one of the only colleges as right now that doesn't. Uh, so we have no limit to how many physicians can come in. Uh, the best way to describe it is kind of how I did before. If they are able to apply, um, if they're eligible for a license, they can achieve it. If they're eligible to bill fee for service, they can easily achieve it. So we have no ceiling on the number of physicians they can come into an Alberta and set up, you know, put out a sign and set up a shop and start billing the uh, the, uh, the provincial government on fee for service. So that is also one of the reasons why the provincial government has been looking, you know, has looked at these types of things because it does make um, budgeting very quick, you know, very tricky. If you don't know the supply that are going to be billing, there's no ceiling. Um, you know, if we had a hundred thousand doctors come to Alberta tomorrow and set up shop, 
there's nothing to stop them and all of them can start billing fee for service. So there, as of right now, there's no quota in Alberta. Um, what we all do is we can make res recommendations to the universities about opening up more seats in uh, their medical programs, but that is kind of all we can do at this point is make strong recommendations saying, you know, we are forecasting a, you know, a shortfall in this area or in that area. We recommend, you know, opening more seats. But again, doing that is, again, a 10-year or more um, process where we don't see that outcome for a long, long time. So, um, and there's also other pieces that, you know, problems that we can't quite solve in Alberta. So, you know, this crunch of physicians is not just Alberta, it's not just a certain community, it's, it's, it's nationwide, it's almost global at this point. Um, and there's also lots of specialties that we don't even train for in Alberta. So there's, you know, certain pediatric specialties that you have to go to Toronto to be trained for that we don't even, you know, the schools here don't even offer because they're so specialized. And, you know, that's, that's true in a lot of different specialties as well. I know it's not quite, ap you know, applicable in, in rural, but it does impact, you know, what we can do. And uh, the, the concern of if someone has to leave to get trained, are they going to come back? And that is always a, a concern that we have as well if we can't offer, you know, different programs and stuff. And that becomes the same kind of concern if someone is in a rural program and then to do the residency, they have to be in an urban city. Are we going to lose this person because, you know, they've fallen in love in Calgary, they've bought a home, they've trained here, This now they're setting up their life in Calgary and not in, you know, in a spill for, <laughs> as I'm looking at Alicia. So, um, like there, those are the concerns that, you know, we have to, we have to try to, uh, that happen, uh, life happens in, uh, when you're going through, uh, medical school, you have all best laid intentions and who knows will you, where you will end up at the end. So hopefully I answered that question. I know it's, it's really, it's really hard. The, uh, we're all supposed to be operating at arm's length from each other. So the best we can do is strong recommendations. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so Donna was next. We just have a few minutes left here. Um, so we'll try very hard to get to the questions that are there and uh, those with your hands up. Um, if you did want to put questions in the chat as well, if we are not able to get to your question, we can absolutely forward those on as well. So um, Vanessa, maybe I will ask Donna to unmute and then I'll let her ask her question. Sure. Thank you very much. It's Donna Bashinsky from the town of Falaire. Um, I just had a couple comments. One was um, just on your, the last comment from the other speaker was about more, having more spots in, in Alberta um, in the education of physicians. In March, the uh, province announced that they are opening 100 more spots in vet, veterinarian medicine. Oh, so yes. <laughs> so it would really be nice if there was, you know, if they had that focus on um, physician, like people doctors. Yeah. The other yeah. comment. <laughs> and they announced that at a, at a convention. So um, the other comment that I have is we do have a nurse practitioner in one of our clinics here. Um, you're right. There was that little bit of uh, education to the public. It didn't take long. And with the public seeing the benefits of having her on staff, she supports the physicians 110%. The issue we're seeing a little bit, and I don't know if it's really an issue, I think it's more education again of the physicians themselves. Yeah. They're not understanding her role um, and how, you know, how much she does support them so that they can look at more patients. Um, some of them, some of the comments are, you know, they're taking or she's taking their patients where they're not seeing well, you know, she's actually making it so they can see more patients. So it was just kind of a comment that I did want to bring, but um, she is a big value to the community that we see. So um, thank you for taking my comments. Appreciate well, thank it. Thank you, we pre appreciate that. And yeah, that is, um, I, I did use the word and I, as soon as it came out of my mouth, I was uh, you know, highly aware that it's the incorrect one that of the word replace. We, absolutely do not want to replace physicians uh, with other allied health professionals. It is to enhance everyone's practice and be able to, um, you know, provide healthcare with the resources that 
that we have and the supply that we have. Um, I, I know from personal experience that even my physician is concerned about, you know, if we use physician assistants and clinical assistants and all these that, you know, he's getting replaced and his scope is getting limited. And, and you, that is not the goal at all. We're not trying to, you know, have take away what they can do and bill and uh, their livelihood at all. It's, you know, trying to work within the limited supply and, you know, other issues that that we have. Um, it's just there's a bit of uh, fear mongering that's that's, you know, kind of gone on in the last few years with the prospect of different legislations and and stuff among physicians that, you know, they will always be a vital and important part of healthcare. So uh, if any, whatever we can do to, you know, enhance healthcare in Alberta, we're going to try and, uh, there's just certain things that will take time and, you know, change of per, um, you know, change of, uh, public perception, you know, when I, I assume when cell phones came out, everyone thought how dumb to carry this thing around with you all the time. <laughs> and, uh, I don't think, you know, our phones ever really leave our hand anymore. So, you know, how quickly, um, public perception of something can change. Thanks so much. Um, just uh, there was a little bit of a question around um, recruitment uh, as it involves PCNs and Covenant Health facilities in communities, but I do wonder if that might be better answered in just a general email um, sure. out if you wouldn't mind kind of getting that answer for us. Um, but I did want to open it up. I did see one more hand up, but it has now gone down. So um, <laughs> I think we have two minutes for uh, just maybe one very, very quick question. Um, if you, if uh, that's still a question. Um, otherwise, we will plan to wrap up. I do have a question. Okay. Um, so I'm Paula. Um, I'm the uh, clinical manager here at Wabasca. Um, we don't have a committee um, for um, welcoming or even um, uh, giving a new physician a tour of the community, anything like that. I'm, I'm actually personally taking responsibility of this. Our um, community medical director is not, doesn't actually live in the community. It's really kind of confusing. And he also doesn't do any of the um, uh, initial um, gestures for, for the physicians. And we are supposed to have some incoming. I'm just wondering how, how AHS can help me um, create some sort of network or support where I can have the um, new recruits actually properly introduced to the community. Yeah, um, so Paula, if you don't mind jump, me jumping in for just a second there, um, Anita Fayan is the, um, is the RPAP consultant for that area. And if you're not connected with her, I can absolutely connect you with her. Um, but Vanessa, I'll hand it back to you as well. Sure, I was just gonna kind of say that the best approach would be to connect with the RPAP consultant in that area and the medical affairs office within that, that area to address those issues more at a more local level um, to see what everyone can do to work together to support the clinic and the community. So I am already, uh, Anita actually invited me to this, this um, meeting. It's just that um, I don't know who else to speak to. Would that be the interim community medical director, even though he doesn't live in the community? This is Susan Smith in the North Zone. Um, some of the communities that I work for, and it's more on the sort of the Northwest part of the North Zone. And um, and if I, I see Linda Robothan's on the phone, so I'll pick on her and she's with the <laughs> cash. And um, we've been sort of collaborating and really it is, um, you know, we've had a recent two site visits and just myself reaching out and the different members of the community volunteering while they're working on establishing a attraction and retention committee. They've been very generous in helping with site tours and and you know, providing information for the position, looking for realty. We had a dinner where everyone came together or, or a meeting, I guess I should say, and we all came together. And as the physicians, hopefully in August, they will be there. I'm, I'm sure Linda and her crew and that will make sure that they attend, you know, whatever's happening in Grand Cash, connecting with, you know, the, the manager of the fitness center. 
So I think as Vanessa suggested, maybe um, maybe your uh, along with the RPAP consultant and your position resource planner for that area can you know kind of help to bring some of those ties together for you in the interim. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say we're now at 12.02, so I think we're going to have to wrap up what has been a really amazing um, conversation. Um, if that is all right, I may um, just thank you for the presentation. So um, thank you so much. It was great information, so many questions, um, and the more informed we are, the better we can uh, help to support the work that you're doing and uh, support rural health care providers um, as well. So. Um, that is all that we have for this session today. Thank you so much for um, hopping on the call and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day and a good long weekend. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.